You know, we were actually planning to begin a sermon series today that would kick off these 21 days of prayer and fasting, but you know, with everything that's currently unfolding within our community and within our church, sometimes you just need to hit pause and speak to the need of the moment. Uh, This was not how I imagined 2023 would begin, but it's where we are, and we will move forward. Can I get an amen? And so that's what we're going to do today. If you would turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3, if you don't have a Bible with you, we will have it up on the screen. And I want to begin in verse 8. Finally, all of you, be like-minded. Another version says, live in harmony. Be sympathetic. Love one another. Be compassionate and humble. Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult. On the contrary, repay evil with blessing because to this you were called so that you may inherit a blessing. For whoever would love life and see good days must keep their tongue from evil and their lips from deceitful speech. They must turn from evil and do good. They must seek peace and pursue it. Touchdown. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are attentive to their prayer, but the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Who's going to harm you if you're eager to do good? But even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear what they fear. Do not be frightened. You know, I want to share for a few minutes today from the thought, stand firm. Stand firm, because, you know, this letter is written to churches scattered across really an area what it, that is known as Asia Minor, which is modern-day Turkey, and really they're under the control of the Roman Empire. And the Roman Empire is growing. It's a worldwide power. It's massive. But with all of that pressure coming in, there, are, there is division in the streets, so many different cultures, so many different ideologies, so many different philosophies, and all of this fear is starting to creep into the church. And so Peter is saying to the church, no, stand firm. Endure. Keep your eyes fixed on Jesus. Do not fear what they fear. And that really is the hope that we have today as we jump into what Peter is going to describe for us because you will face suffering on some level to some degree this year. But you can stand firm. You know, it reminds me of a story that Jesus told in Matthew chapter 7. You know the story. Jesus tells a story about a wise man and a foolish man. I've, I've used it many times, but Jesus said, a wise man built his house on the rock. And a foolish man built his house on the sand. And when the storm came, when the suffering came, when the hardship came, when the pressure came from the outside, the wise man's house stood strong, while the foolish man's house crumbled. Wisdom does not prevent suffering, wisdom does not prevent hardship. Wisdom does not prevent storms. However, the entire story is predicated on one simple fact. Are you wise or are you foolish? How do you know which one you are? It simply comes down to the foundation you choose to build on. That a wise person chooses to build on solid rock that withstands the storm. But a foolish person builds their house on sand, on sand that crumbles in the storm. And so what does the solid rock represent? The solid rap, rap, rock represents the words of Jesus. Come on. Are you with me? I know I'm not in here by myself today. The solid rock represents Jesus. Because Jesus is the only thing worth building your life upon. He is solid rock that when suffering comes, you can stand firm. 
You know, when Jesus told the story, he's not talking about a physical house. He's talking about your life. And what is it that he says about your life? He wants you to get a picture that as exterior pressure comes, the question is, what is your interior life built on? What are you made of? What is the foundation of your life? How many know foundations are something that you cannot see? And sometimes it's the things that you cannot see that are the most important. And this is how our entire interior life works. And so how are we strengthening and building our interior life today? How are we continuing to build upon Jesus? You know, the idea of building upon Jesus can become so complex, but I believe in many ways today that is what Peter is trying to do. Peter wants to be very practical, and he wants to prescribe to you how you can stand firm through the storms by building your life on Jesus and what that actually looks like. Are you ready to get into it? He says, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 8, Finally, all of you live in harmony with one another. Be sympathetic, love one another, be compassionate and humble. You know what Peter's going to do here is Peter's going to focus in on an area of a muscle that you have to strengthen in order to stand firm. It's some of those muscles that we don't always pay attention to that matter the most. Where is everybody over 40 at? Yeah. It's some of those muscles that we don't always focus on that matter the most. You know, my lower back, I can't, I don't want to get into my, my, my physical ailments today, but my lower back has been killing me. I'm not what I once was, and I'm learning how important it is to have a strong foundation, a strong core. But, you know, Peter is about to tell us practically how we should respond to hardship and how we should respond to suffering. And he begins with this little phrase, live in harmony. Say it with me. Live in harmony. Live in harmony with who? He's talking to the church and he's letting you know that you're going to face pressure. You're going to face storms. You're going to face suffering. But make sure you live in harmony with each other. Harmony is an interesting concept because we know the term in music. And the way that you get harmony is that you need multiple singers. And so someone sings the melody and then uh, other people come alongside and the, the, the melody and they sing other notes that what we call the harmony, or no, the melody. Am I, am I getting my words mixed up? No, 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 yeah. <laughs> As you can tell, I do not do this for a living. Anyways, it's called harmony, and I hope you can see some of this stuff today because if you're going to face suffering, you're going to need uh, some people around you. But our church needs to walk in harmony. The body of Christ in a year and in a season that can be so polarizing and so confusing, I'm pleading with us, let us walk in harmony. And really, you need more than one person for harmony to be effective. Because you get multiple people singing, and this is how music works, right? I'm going to give it one more shot. Music is everybody playing their part to create, create something bigger something better and so you get all of a sudden the piano player who hits three notes and that's called a chord am i on the right track and then you get a drummer who then puts down some rhythm come on somebody and then you get some singers that come along and they start to sing the melody and some others start to sing the harmony and before you know it it's this beautiful moment and it's called a song and it's called music but it's many parts coming together in harmony it's a picture of what it looks like in our faith to walk with one another and Peter is like you want to know what walking in harmony is like well it looks like being sympathetic and sympathy really is a key word because I know we talk about empathy and empathy is vital. 
and important and powerful, but how many know in order to get to empathy, you've got to first go through sympathy. Sympathy is a feeling. And I know most of the time you hear me preach, like, don't make decisions by your feelings. Don't live by your emotion, live by devotion. And I believe that. But I want to be really careful that we understand feelings matter. I don't think God created you with all those emotions if none of them mattered. I don't want to be led by emotions, but I want to pay attention to my emotions. Because emotions turn an interaction into a connection. It's our emotions that make us unique and make us human beings. And so to live in harmony means we laugh together. To live in harmony means we cry together. To live in harmony means we celebrate together. To live in harmony means we grieve together. I have sympathy for my brother and my sister. But Peter continues, you want to know what harmony is like? It's like loving one another. The Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 13 gives us an incredible description of love. He says this, beginning in verse 4, love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. Love always protects. Always trusts always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. Love never fails. He says, love one another. And you want to know what harmony is? It, it, it's, it's being compassionate and humble. I like how he uses that word compassionate there. He doesn't, he doesn't leave it out. Sympathy is a feeling But compassion is an action. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believes in Him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Jesus loved you so much that He came to you. There was an action attached to His love that I'm actually a person of compassion. It's not just enough for us to feel bad for one another. We actually have to do what we can for one another. Everybody wants to change the world, but nobody wants to start in their own backyard. Who can you be compassionate towards today? How can you walk in harmony? He says, you've got to be humble. You've got to be humble, man. Because humility is the key ingredient to a healthy community. It's a preferring of other people. You say, but Mike, I thought you were talking about how to stand firm. I am. I'm letting you know that when pressure comes from the outside, there's got to be something that we're already doing on the inside. I'm already walking with brothers and sisters in the Lord, that I'm walking in harmony, that I'm being sympathetic, that I'm feeling what they feel, that I'm loving others, that I'm being compassionate, and I'm being humble. It's about us building on Jesus a firm foundation. The storm will come. The hardship will come. The suffering is going to happen. It's unavoidable. But we can stand firm. And so I want to show you quickly how to stand firm. Number one, Peter would say, if you want to stand firm, you have to be a blessing. Be a blessing. In verse 9, he says, do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult. On the contrary, you you don't live like the rest of the world. You don't operate like everybody else. Repay evil with blessing." Because to this you were called so that you may inherit a blessing. Let me just tell you something right now. Our knee-jerk reaction when someone says or does something that is offensive 
is to be defensive, to put our guard up, to give a rebuttal, to give our side of the story. It's just called being a human being. It's natural. But everything about following God goes against our flesh and goes against the world. And what Peter is saying is like, you really want to know how to handle suffering? Do you really want to respond to it the right way when people are saying something about you or doing something to you or you're going to go through something that you don't understand and you're confused? He says, first thing, be a blessing. Look for an opportunity to be a miracle for someone else. Look for a chance to actually bless someone because people broken and hurting are all around us. And so what if our entire church just started there today? Can you imagine? What if the, this week the Spirit of God, the same Spirit that inspired Peter to write down these words could be the same Spirit that will prompt you and that you would go and you would listen and you would love and you would serve and you would listen. And the more we do, the more we're going to be a blessing to other people. Are you with me? And when you start to be a blessing, then guess what? He says, because to this you were called that you may inherit a blessing. That when I give blessings, I'm also inheriting a blessing. Be a blessing. But number two, stay clean. Stay clean. For whoever would love life and see good days must keep their tongue from evil and their lips from deceitful speech. They must turn from evil and do good. They must seek peace and pursue it. Man, isn't that good? Only three of us. Well, I was encouraged. Because what Peter is saying is, hey, look, you got to stay clean. You got to watch what you're saying. You actually got to check yourself out. You need to look yourself in the mirror. You don't want to look like the world. You want to be different than the world. And so the first you... You first want to say, how can I be a blessing? When I give blessings, I give blessings, but I want to stay clean in all of this. You know, we live in a funny time right now where people, uh, where because of the internet, people can say whatever they want, whenever they want. And I'm not going to lie, sometimes people start posting stuff on social media and I wish I could say, I just never pay attention to any, any of it. That like Jesus, I'm just walking on water over the comments, right? But so many times what you'll discover is that people who are saying something negative or something hurtful, it's because they're hurt. And so before you respond, I think it's important that you stop and maybe ask yourself, is this person hurting? Because hurt people hurt people. And literally, Peter is like, whoever would love life and see good days must keep their tongue from evil and his lips from deceitful speech. I mean, come on, this has never been more practical for our community. It's easy to let people know what you think or how you feel. To say something negative about someone, to gossip about someone. But he says, what does he say? He says, seek peace and pursue it. I wonder, are you seeking peace today? Jesus, what did he say? He said, blessed are the peacemakers. Come on, Mama Lani. He doesn't say, blessed are the peacekeepers. Because peacekeepers would say, let's just kind of, let's just sweep that to the side and and act like nothing happened. There's a difference between making peace and keeping peace. I think most of us are like, yeah, 
I'm down to keep some peace. No, you're called to go a step further. You are called to stay clean. You are called to make peace and pursue it. You are called to be a bridge and a gap. This is what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5. He says, you are ambassadors of Christ. Jesus has given you his ministry of reconciliation that you are being a bridge to this outside world of people that are hurting and you're the bridge from where they are to where Jesus is. And you represent that. You are his ambassador. You're called to make peace. You're called to bridge the gap and say, let's make peace. I was thinking just about this idea of staying clean and I was thinking like, I was just thinking, I had this image in my mind of a glass or a cup of water. I don't have one with me, but just imagine for a moment that as you have this image of a cup of water in your mind, that it represents you. I I believe that God didn't just create you so that you could exist on this earth. I believe that God created you that you might bring Him glory by being useful for His kingdom work. God wants to use you, and really God isn't looking for a whole lot. What is God looking for? God wants to pour into you. He wants to fill you up so that He can pour you out. And the only thing that God really needs in order to fill you up and pour you out is He needs a vessel that is empty and that is clean. And clean is not being perfect. Clean is I fight different. This is not a battle between flesh and blood. This is a spiritual battle that we are in. And I I let God do the fighting. I'm not trying to prove myself today. Are you with me? I'm not trying to protect myself. I'm not going into self-preservation mode. That's what Jesus says in John chapter 10 when he says, I'm the good shepherd. I'm not like the hired hand. Because you know what the hired hand does when things get hard? When the wolf comes, what does he do? They run. Jesus says, not me. I lay my life down. I'm not, trying to, uh, I'm not trying to lift up the name of Lighthouse Church. I'm trying to honor the name of God. And if God can find a cup that is clean, then God will continue to fill it up in order to pour it out. Can I get one more amen? amen. Number three, how to stand firm. Remember, the Lord is watching. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are attentive to their prayer, but the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. I think when you're going through suffering, it's really important that you remember the Lord is watching. The Lord sees everything. The Lord has a different point of view than what I have. He sees it and his eyes stay on the righteous. God, I'm going to honor you. God, I don't understand what is going on right now, this is hurting, this is hurting me, this is painful, but God, I know you're watching. And his ears are attentive to their prayer. He hears you. How comforting is that, that when you're suffering, that God actually hears you. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil, and so watch your tongue. Stay clean. Be a blessing. Remember the Lord is watching. And Peter will go on to say, do not fear. Do not fear. Who's going to harm you if you're eager to do good? But even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear what they fear. Do not be frightened. I want that to be an encouragement to some people today. Who is going to harm you if you're eager to do good? Meaning, if my intention is to do good, most likely, I'm going to be okay. But even if you're not, you're going to be blessed. Maybe not in this life, but maybe in the life to come. And then he quotes Isaiah there. He says, do not fear what they fear. Do not be frightened. 
Someone should get that in their spirit right now. Do not fear what they fear. Do not fear what they fear. Who is they? What the world fears. Do not be frightened. Sometimes we got a church walking around afraid of the same things the world is afraid about. Newsflash, Jesus Christ conquered death, hell, and the grave. You don't have to fear suffering. You don't have to fear hardship. You can rest assured that even if you face it, you can stand firm today. This is not a message to create fear. This is a message to build your faith. Because those are the two options you have. We have a God that wants healing and justice and love and repentance and restoration and redemption. And we've got an enemy that wants destruction and division and fear and hate. And we have two choices, two narratives that we can pursue. Like I said, this is, this is not a message to create fear. This is a message to build your faith. Life is more than the 80 years on this earth. Life is more than just one moment. Life is eternal, and we can walk through it, and we can walk through it because of Jesus, and we don't have to fear. Do not fear what they fear. I feel like I got to preach on that next week, too. Do not fear what they fear. I wonder, am I afraid of everything the world is afraid of? Something is wrong there. I don't want their fear to be my fear. I want my fear to be, God, I want to be used. I want to know you. God, I want to give you my all. God, I want to be, I want my neighbor to know about you. God, I know that you want healing and, and repentance and restoration and redemption. God, I want what you want. Do not fear. And lastly, how to stand firm. Be prepared. Be prepared. Peter says, but in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience, for it is better if it's God's will to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. You know, Peter says, be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you for the reason why you have hope. Hey, hey man, how are you responding this way? How are you continuing to be a blessing even though you're going through this difficult situation? How are you keeping it clean and remembering that the Lord is watching even when you can't see him? Hey, man, how is it that you're operating not in fear, but you're operating in faith? You need to be prepared. And as you study the Greek, this is where we get the word apologetics. And of course, there's no doubt that we need to learn about our faith. You need to discover your doctrine. You need to have a good answer. You need to actually learn and dig deeper into God's word. But friends, please don't miss the big idea. And the big idea is that nobody has ever been argued into the kingdom of God. See, when I read this and it says, be prepared to give a reason for the hope that you have, what I understand is that God has a bigger point of view and God is telling a bigger story and God says all things work together for those who love and trust him. And I don't know about you, but if I can just be honest today, my reason is not an argument. And my reason is not because life has been easy. In fact, most of my reason as to why I have this hope is not because of the absence of suffering, but instead of the presence of a Savior. Amen. And so why do I have hope? Because every time I found myself in these deep waters, every time I found myself in this deep pain, a Savior has shown up and has walked beside me. I can take you down memory lane right now. Most of the reasons why I believe in God is not because I didn't face hardship. And it's not because I didn't face suffering. Most of the reasons why I believe in God is because God was with me in the suffering. 
And so I live my life being prepared with a reason. I have a reason. And his name is Jesus. He's never left me. He has never forsaken me. He has never abandoned me. He has never done me wrong. He has walked with me and he has carried me through. And today I plead with you, it's not what you're going through that matters most. It is who you are going to that matters. His name is Jesus Christ. He is solid rock. He is the firm foundation. You can rest assured if you build your life on him, he works. And so right now we're going to prepare to take communion and I want to read the last part of this passage with you. He, he says here in verse 18, he says, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body but made alive in the spirit. After being made alive, he went and made proclamation to the imprisoned spirits, to those who were disobedient long ago, when God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built. In it, only a few people, eight in all, were saved through water. And this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you also. Not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a clear conscience toward God. It, baptism, saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ who has gone into heaven and is at God's right hand with angels, authorities, and powers in submission to him. What an amazing scripture. You know, I had some good news that I wanted to share with you. I know that we're in a difficult moment, but even in these moments, God is still working. And uh, later on this afternoon, we're going to have a new brother in Christ. His name is Steen Sprowski. I think I said that right. And um, he's going to be baptized into Jesus Christ. And that's what this scripture is talking about. Sometimes we have baptisms here at the end of our services and we get a nice little, you know, golf clap. And, you know, we're you know, we're all like kind of having side conversations, but I just wanted to take a moment and look at this verse because it's a miracle. He uses this example of Noah. And what did Noah do? do? Help me out. Come on, what did he do? He built an ark. It's not a trick question. I'm not, I'm not trying to put anybody on the spot today. Noah built an ark because God was going to send this flood. And Noah and his, and his family, eight and all, entered into this ark that saved them from the flood and from the wrath of God. And what is Peter's point? Peter is saying that when you were baptized, Jesus Christ was the ark that you entered into that saved you from your sin. Come on. That this isn't just the removal of dirt from your body. But this is a pledge of a good conscience towards God. That it saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ who has gone into heaven and is at God's right hand with angels, authorities, and powers in submission to him. He's not afraid. God is not anxiously pacing the halls of heaven today. No, he he is large and in charge. And everything is in submission to him. And to him be the glory today. Amen? Amen. Let's pray for the communion. Father, we come to you just in awe of your majesty, of your glory. We're so grateful for Jesus that the righteous one took on our sin, the sin of the unrighteous, and he paid the price that we could never pay so that there would be this hope of restoration and redemption. We couldn't get to you, God. We can never be good enough. I know we hear that term a lot, and it's encouraging that we are enough, but in terms of the gospel, God, we're not enough. 
We can never be enough. And the good news is that Jesus Christ is enough and that he paid the price so that we could enter into him through baptism and that we could be saved and washed from our sins. It's it's in a miracle, Father. We're so grateful for what he has done. And God, I say a special prayer for Steen as he makes you Lord of his life today. God, I pray just for his walk with you. Thank you for the way that you are redeeming him. And thank you for the way that you have restored all of us, Father. I pray that as we navigate this difficult season with the things that, that have happened, God, our heart breaks for those that have been hurt. And we stand with them, Father. But God, we want to we want to be a blessing. You know, we want to stay clean. We want to remember that you're watching. We don't want to be afraid. We do not want to fear. We want to be prepared to give a reason for the hope that we have. And we love you so much. We honor your son, Jesus Christ, and it's in his name we pray. Amen.